Hello everyone and welcome back to Ways of the World, a brief global history with sources. As we continue our study of economic transformation, commerce and consequence, we're going to finish this up with commerce and people, the trans transatlantic slave system. All right, this is the transatlantic slave system map uh, stimulated by the plantation complex of the Americas. The transatlantic slave system represented an enormous extension of the ancient practice of people owning and selling other people. So according to the map, where were most of the African slaves taken to in the Americas? Why were they brought to these regions? Most of the African slaves taken to the Americas were transported to the West Indies and Brazil, where the labor demands of the sugar plantations were most intense. All right, the slave trade in context. Most human societies have had slaves. Africans had practiced slavery and sold slaves for centuries. The Trans-Saharan trade took slaves to the Mediterranean world. East African slave trade existed since the 7th century. And the Islamic slave trade resulted in many Africans living outside of the continent. And slavery took up many forms, depending on the region and the time period. Uh, in the Indian Ocean, slaves were often assimilated into their owner's households. Children of slaves were sometimes free, sometimes slaves. In the Islamic world, they preferred female slaves and slaves for domestic work. The Atlantic slave system favored male slaves for plantation work. And not all slaves had lowly positions. Uh, in the Islamic world, many slaves had military or political status. But the most pre-modern slaves worked in households, farms, or shops. Now there's a distinctiveness of the slave system in the Americas. The scale and importance of the slave, excuse me, slave system in the Americas were enormous. It was largely based on plantation agriculture. Uh, slave status was inherited. There was little hope of manumission or being granted freedom. Widespread slavery, slavery was part of a society that valued human freedom and equality, unlike anywhere else except maybe ancient Greece. And slavery was wholly identified with Africa and with quote-unquote blackness. And the origins of the Atlantic slavery lay in the Mediterranean and with sugar production. Sugar production was the first quote unquote modern industry. Uh, there's major capital investment, technology, disciplined workers, and it was a mass market. The work was very difficult and dangerous. Uh, there are limits of surf labor, and there's an absence of wage workers. So slaves were ideal. Until Constantinople fell, the Slavs from the Black Sea region provided most of the slaves for the Mediterranean sugar plantations. And the Portuguese found an alternative slave source in West Africa with the rise of plantations. The Africans became the primary source of slave, la slave labor for the Americans. Slavs weren't available. They received papal permission in 1452. Indians, excuse me, Native Americans died because of European diseases. Europeans were a bad alternative. Christians from marginal lands couldn't be enslaved. And endangered servants were expensive and temporary. Africans were already familiar with farming techniques. They had some immunity to diseases. They were not Christian, and they were readily available. And this long debate took place on how much racism was involved. All right, slavery, slavery in the Islamic world. This 18th century image of a slave accompanying her upper class, excuse me, upper class Turkish owner to the public baths highlights the slave trade in the Ottoman and Indian Ocean worlds and serves as a reminder that slavery was not limited to the Atlantic world in the early modern era. Unlike in the Americas, most slaves in North Africa and Southwest Asia served as domestic servants with female slaves generally preferred to male slaves. Now based on this image, how did slavery in the Islamic world differ from Atlantic slavery? The image depicts the Turkish woman owning an African woman, characteristic of slavery in the Islamic world, wherein slaves were primarily domestic servants and overwhelmingly women. Though many female slaves were domestic servants in the Americas, slavery there was characterized by men working in the sugar and later cotton, tobacco, and other cash crop fields and in the mines. All right, the slave trade in practice. Now, the slave trade was driven by European demand. Europeans traded freely with African merchants and elites. 
Now, from capture to sale on the coast, trade was in African hands. Africans received trade goods in return, including firearms, often bought with American silver. But there's a harrowing journey for the slave uh, to the coast and out of the country. The increasing pace of the Atlantic slave trade. During the 16th century, fewer than 3,000 slaves were shipped annually. But from 1700 to 1800, that marked the high point. So let's talk about who was enslaved. People from West and South Central Africa, which is present-day Mauritania and uh, Angola. Mostly people from marginal groups like prisoners of war, debtors, or criminals. And Africans generally did not sell their quote-unquote own peoples. Now, there's a vast majority of slaves that ended up in Brazil and the Caribbean. A smaller number, excuse me, ended up in North America, mainly in Spanish America or Europe. About 15% of those enslaved died during the Middle Passage. Now, there are various forms of resistance, from slow work to outright rebellion to fleeing. Now, there's also these maroon societies, escaped slaves mixed with Native Americans, mestizos, and renegade Europeans. Now, Palmeiras in Brazil, there were uh, approximately 10,000 or more people, um, and then the Haitian Revolution of the 1790s. All right, the Middle Passage. Uh, this image shows, um, or this 19th, excuse me, mid 19th century painting of slaves held below decks on a Spanish slave ship illustrates the horrendous conditions of the transatlantic voyage, a journey experienced by billions of captured Africans. So, how would a historian use this image to describe the conditions on slave ships sailing on the Middle Passage? Well, the deplorable conditions included cramped, closed quarters, darkness, lack of adequate sanitation, and clearly insufficient food. All right, the slave trade in numbers from 1501 to 1866, the rise and decline of the slave trade. Now, what best explains the rapid growth in the slave trade leading up to 1800? What explains the steep drop in the slave trade after 1850? Well, the boom of the American plantation economies between 1750 and 1800 accounts for the rapid growth of the slave trade in that period. The steep drop can be accounted for by natural increase or reproduction among slaves from the previous year, 150 years, the diplomatic pressure of the British government, and the ending of slavery itself in the United States in the 1860s. All right, the destination of slaves. According to the pie chart, where did the majority of African slaves end up, and what best explains this trend? Well, the pie chart shows that most slaves went to Brazil and the Caribbean, which had the largest concentration of sugar plantations, which required the greatest amount of slave labor. All right, consequences. The impact of the slave trade in Africa. Now, this, the slave trade uh, created new global linkages. It slowed Africa's growth while Europe and China expanded in population. There's a demand for African slaves that generated economic stagnation and political disruption in Africa. Those who profited in the trade did not invest in production, and they did not generate breakthroughs in agriculture or industry. And since Europeans didn't increase the demand for Africa's products just for its people, now, the social effects. It fostered moral corruption, unbalanced sex ratios in Africa, increased uh, substantially la uh, labor demands on women, uh, led to more polygamous households, led to the increased use of female slaves in West Africa. A few women benefited by marrying European merchants, uh, with some signaris, operating their own trading empires. The women participated in several state-building enterprises. Uh, the Kingdom of Dahomey was ruled over by a queen mother. In the Kingdom of Kondo, Congo, women held lower administrative positions and served on the monarch's council of advisors. And Matamba also had female rulers. Now, that, let's talk about the effect of the transatlantic slave system and how it differed from place to place. There are many small-scale kinship uh, based societies 
and were thoroughly disrupted. Some larger kingdoms, such as Congo and Oyo, slowly disintegrated as trading opportunities and firearms enabled outliers to become independent. Benin, in the forest area of present-day Nigeria, succeeded in limiting the effects of the slave trade until the 1700s. It diversified its exports and bought firearms and other goods. They banned the export of male slaves until 1700s. And only with the decline in the 1700s did Benin re-engage in the slave trade. Now, Dahomey actively participated in slave trade during the early 1700s, but only under royal control. There's an annual slave raids by the army in Dahomey, and the government depended on the slave trade for essential revenue. All right, a scenario of Senegal. Well, many women suffered greatly because of the Atlantic slave trade. A few uh, grew quite wealthy and powerful. Known as Signaris, the, um, these ladies, they married European merchants and built their own trading networks, employing female slaves. The woman in this 18th century French image was likely a Signare, and if I mispronounce that, I'm sorry, uh, depicted at the European slave port of St. Louis Island in Senegal. She's dressed in fashionable and expensive imported textiles and is accompanied by her slave. So use evidence from this image to explain how Signaris express their wealth and power. The Signara here in this image expressed her wealth and power through luxurious imported dress that covers her from neck to toe and by being waited on by a poorly dressed slave woman. All right, let's talk about Ayuba Suleiman Diallo. In February of 1730, um, that found Ayuba Suleiman de Yobo, less than 30 years of age, living between the Gambia and Senegal rivers in West Africa among the Fulbe speaking people. Er, Fulbe speaking people. Like his father, a prominent Islamic scholar and teacher, Ayuba was a Muslim who was literate in Arabic, a prayer leader in the local mosque, and a Havz, uh, someone who had memorized the entire Quran. He was also a husband to two wives and father to four children. Now his father sent the young man on an errand. He was to take several of their many slaves to a location some 200 miles away where an English trading ship had anchored and exchanged them for paper and other goods. The paper was especially important to his father uh, and his income. It, <clears throat> excuse me, it depended on inscribing passages from the Quran on small slips of paper and selling them as protective charms. And to put it mildly, things did not go as planned. Unable to reach an agreement with the English merchant, Captain Stephen Pike, um, Ayuba traveled farther south and traded his slaves for a number of cows in the land of Mendinka people. Well beyond the safety of his own country, he was in dangerous territory. As he and his companions stopped to rest on the journey home, they were seized, their heads were shaved, and they were sold as slaves to the very same Captain Pike. Now, although Yuba was able to send a message to his father asking to be ransomed, in exchange for some of their slaves, the ship sailed before a reply was received. And so Ayuba, along with 168 other slaves, both men and women, headed for the British American colony of Maryland, where 150 of them arrived alive. Now, sold to a local planter, Ayuba was immediately sent to the tobacco fields, where he became ill from this heavy and unaccustomed work. His owner assigned him the less arduous and more familiar task of tending cattle. Alone with the cattle, Yuba was able to withdraw into a nearby forest to pray, but he was spotted by a young European boy who mocked him and threw dirt in his face. Sometime later, no doubt in despair, a Yuba ran away, but he was soon captured and housed in the county jail, located in the back room of a tavern. There, he became something of a local curiosity and attracted the attention of a lawyer named Thomas Blewett. When a Yuba refused wine, he wrote a few lines in Arabic and mentioned Allah and Muhammad. Bluett realized that he was, quote-unquote, no common slave. After locating an old slave who could translate for him, Bluett became fascinated by Ayuba's story, and he initiated a process that took both of them to England in 1733, where philanthropists purchased Ayuba's freedom. Now, Ayuba's reaction in England was amazing. Now fluent in English, he was received by the English royal family and various members of the nobility, 
hosted by leading scholars and entertained by wealthy merchants, eager to tap his knowledge of economic conditions in West Africa. The prominent artist, William Hoare, painted his portrait, complete with a small Koran hanging from his neck. In 1734, he finally set for home, loaded with gifts from his English friends. There he encountered, quite by chance, the same Mendinka men who had sold him, uh, sold him only a few years before. Francis Moore, a European trader accompanying Ayuba, wrote that he fell into a most terrible passion and was for killing them. That's a quote. And was restrained from doing so only with difficulty. Ayuba arrived in his hometown to find that his father had recently died. His wives and children, however, were all alive and welcomed him warmly. Warmly, One of his wives had remarried, believing him gone forever, but her new husband readily gave way, and Ayuba resumed his place of prominence in his own community until his death in 1773. He also resumed his life as a slave owner. Selling some of the gifts he had acquired in England, he purchased a woman slave and two horses soon after his arrival back in West Africa. According to Moore, he, quote-unquote, spoke almost very handsomely of the English, and he continued his association with the Royal African Company, the primary English trading firm in West Africa, and their rivalry with the French traders. The last mention of Ayuba in the records of that company noted that he was seeking compensation for the loss of two slaves and a watch, probably the one given him in England by Queen Caroline. Okay. All right. This um, is a detail from a series on mixed race marriages in Mexico by Miguel Cabrera in 1763. What indications of status and ambition or upward mobility can you identify in the image? Keep in mind that status here is associated with race and gender as well as the possession of foreign products. Indications of status, ambition, or upward mobility include the European dress of the man and daughter and the high-status native dress of the woman and the display of porcelain in the foreground. The woman's native status may also speak to the ambitions of her husband who married outside of his own caste. So think about the woman and how she is shown here in more traditional clothing. Well, the man is portrayed in European dress. Why is that? Well, the mode of dress depicted may be meant to emphasize her status as a member of the native caste. For one purpose of these paintings was to represent different racial groups. It may also be that because she is not the per public persona of the family, she need not dress with the same pretensions as her husband. All right, Portrait of Sophie of the Palatinate, 1645. How are European and Brazilian elements mixed in this painting? Note the various garments of clothing that Sophie is wearing. What do you make of the European clasp securing her Brazilian feather cloak in the background scenery? The European dress, or the European dress, neckline, and clasp, and the Brazilian cloak and feather headpiece elements are intertwined in this portrait to provide an image of exoticism and luxury. The European clasp, for, instant, for instance, Binds the two sides of the Brazilian textile symbolically. How is Sophie demonstrating her status in this portrait? What specific messages might she hope to convey by donning the headdress and cape? Sophie is demonstrating both her wealth and her exoticism. Such items from the Americas were too expensive uh, to be owned by common people. Mo moreover, they were exotic, coming from the other side of the world. And... Um, here we have the, uh, or excuse me, a gathering of the Turkish men at an Ottoman coffee house. What specific activities can you identify in this painting? People are drinking coffee, playing board games, playing music, and conversing. Would you read this painting as critical of the coffee house, as celebrating it, or as a neutral description? Note that the musicians and those playing board games at the bottom are engaged in activities that were considered rather disreputable. Would you describe the general demeanor of the men? How would you describe the general demeanor of the men in the coffee house? We could argue that the image is critical of the coffee house by painting to the presence of musicians and those playing board games and the debates surrounding the status of coffee as 
uh, an intoxicant in the Islamic world. You might also argue that the image is neutral by pointing to the negative features, including presence of museums, excuse me, musicians, board games, and coffee, but also to the generally positive features, such as the high status and the good demeanor of the patrons. Lastly, you could make a case that the image celebrates the coffee house by mo- noting the relaxed social setting and the high status and upright demeanor of the patrons. The general demeanor of the men appears to be one of relaxation and enjoyment. And that concludes our study of commerce and people, the transatlantic slave system.